to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. This is episode number 580. My name is Camden Busey, and I serve as the pastor of Hope Orthodox Presbyterian Church up in Grays Lake, Illinois. And we have uh, some of our friends, our regulars, back with us today to talk about the theology and, and all things uh, pertaining to that. We have with us uh, first Jim Cassidy, who serves as pastor of South Austin OP in South Austin, Texas. Hey, Jim, how are you? You're muted. How are you? Ah, boy, we're starting out stellar today, aren't we? I'm great. How about yourself? Great. I thought you might be coming back with a Spanish uh, accent or something. Uh, Jim's fresh <laughs> on the heels of a trip to Col- Colombia, South America. I did, I did learn a little Spanish, but no accent. Un poco. Si. Well, I'm going to be there in, a, in about a month, so um, I'm going to pick your brain. Jim and I have not had the opportunity to, to uh, debrief after his trip, so we're going to talk about some of those things uh, today a little bit, talk about his, his class. He taught an entire class on Cornelius Van Til and the Reformation of Apologetics. Uh, but before we talk about some things like that, we also have with us uh, Glenn Clary. Glenn serves as pastor of uh, Providence OP in Pflugerville, Texas, just there in the Austin area. Welcome back, Glenn. It's great to talk to you as well. Thanks, Camden. Good to be back. Yes, yeah, it's good to have uh, both of you brothers with us. As uh, Today we're going to be speaking about a range of subjects. Uh, don't have a, a particular agenda uh, other than a, a few topic ideas and things we want to discuss uh, pertaining to to some things that have been going on here at Reform Forum and some things we've been reading and working on. Uh, so it's fun once in a while just to take a break and uh, not not have a, a particular book to, to prep or a particular guest. We love doing that, but sometimes it's nice just to have an in-house conversation and see where it takes us. And often we end up in some interesting places. So I'm glad to have Jim and Glenn on with us today to, to talk about some of these matters. Uh, just to catch up on a few things, I'd like pe- for people to check us out online at reformedforum.org. Uh, you know all about what's going on there. At least I hope you do. You could visit us online and find out information about all of our programs. You can also find our store. There's always a, a ready stock of uh, antiquarian books and uh, some rarer reform stuff available on the store that Ryan Noah finds. Um, he's got some stuff coming up soon. He's, he's just told me about some new acquisitions and... Uh, It'll be nice uh, to see what he puts into the store. If you ever want to uh, find like a first edition copy of something by Van Til or Voss or uh, all of our Reformed heroes, then uh, reformedforum.org slash store is the place to be. Also, if you uh, if you head on over, you can still buy the copy or buy a hardcover copy of uh, the new book, Your Heart is Voss by Danny Olinger. And if you've purchased uh, that book uh, directly from the Reform Forum store, you're going to have some some news coming in your email inbox in the future. So we're going to have a hopefully have a, a special event coming up about this about this book. And so um, stay tuned if you if you purchase that book through us, uh, take a look uh, in your email inbox, and and uh, very soon you're going to find out some information about something coming up here in the month of February. Uh, I know I said February want wrong, but sometimes I like to emphasize <laughs> how it's spelled. Um, that, that poor little R is so neglected, <laughs> you know. know. <laughs> also Wednesday, not Wednesday, you know. You, you, you of all people must have some pretty uh, fun ways to pronounce some of those words, Jim. I try to eliminate as many letters as I can <laughs> just to make sure it's shortened and short and sweet. Yeah, you've received your fair share of flack on this program for for the New Jersey accent, but um, it's all well and good. Of course, I don't think I have an accent, but then when I'm in Philadelphia, everyone says I have this very harsh uh, Midwestern accent, so who knows? Who knows? Uh, it's certainly not the Boston accent, but somehow Jeff seemed to have shaked, shaken his, uh, his New England accent over the years, but... Speaking of accents, uh, Jim, you were just down, as I mentioned, down in uh, Colombia, South America. Tell us about what was going on and tell me what's going to happen when I'm going down there with with Doug Clawson. I'd love to hear it. Catch us up. Yeah, it was it was a great trip. So I, I joined uh, Brother Clawson as a representative of um, of the Home Missions, uh, Foreign Missions Committee of the OPC. And uh, we went down there uh, to do a pastor's conference. It's an annual conference that we do at the church in Bogota, the OPC congregation in Bogota, um, called uh, 
something Iglesia uh, Ra, and that's the name of the church. We I just call it the Ra Church for short. And um, uh, the pastor there is Andreas Espinoza, and uh, he is a, a wonderful brother in the Lord, doing doing really good work uh, building the church there in in Bogota. Uh, the church uh, in in Bogota is uh, uh, significantly larger than 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 most OP congregations back here uh, in in the states. And uh, it's it really is filled with with some wonderful dear saints, uh, people who made us feel very welcomed and who were attentive, who listened and who asked some incredible questions. Anyhow, the uh, during the week, Tuesday through Friday, uh, we had uh, I had four hours of of uh, material uh, to do uh, each of those evenings and uh, answering questions and then delivering lectures. And the focus was on the Reformation of Apologetics. So Cornelius Van Til and the Reformation of Apologetics. And um, what I did was I tried to situate Van Til's approach to apologetics within his overall understanding of the ministry. And I begin with a quote by Alan Gelzo. Um, When he met Van Til, he asked Van Til why it was that that he had pursued all this education, why it was that he did uh, PhD work, and why it is that he has written so many books and all this other stuff. And Van Til's answer was, why to protect Christ's little ones? Mm-hmm. And, um, and I thought that that was incredibly telling. And that expression, by the way, uh, protect the protection of Christ's little ones, appears in one form or another uh, scattered throughout Van Til's writings. And so this isn't just sort of this personal off-the-cuff thing that he said in a private conversation. This is th- this is embedded within his thought. And it's it very uh, Johannine. We're studying 1 John uh, right now. It's very similar to, the, to some of the yes. way John describes yes. the church and uh, the believers as um, little children. Yes, as my little child. All right. Or you think about the exhortation um, that Jesus gives to Peter. Yeah, feed my right? sheep, feed my lambs. Feed my, mm. Sheep, mm, feed my lambs. So um, what what I do is I, I try to situate Van Til's approach to apologetics within his overall uh, understanding of his ministry as as a, as a minister as a pastoral ministry. Uh, which is very different than the way in which many have and and many tend to think of Van Til as as mostly an um, an academician or some sort of a uh, you know brainy scholar who uh, you know is is involved in in technical discussions and he is involved in those tech technical discussions and he w- did labor in the academy but he understood his labor in the academy as uh, as one who is a servant of Jesus Christ. Um, called to protect Christ's little ones. And so apologetics needs to be understood kind of in, in, in that context that we're not talking about, um, uh, we don't, Van Til didn't seek to develop a method of apologetics that would uh, provide a club for people to use in order to kind of beat people up in a, to beat atheists up in a debate, to get a gotcha move on them, to, to checkmate them, to change metaphors here a little bit. Um, although Van Til's approach to apologetics certainly does allow us <clears throat> to do that. But everything that Van Til did, um, including his polemics against uh, those within even his own, his own communion, his own reformed fellowship, uh, as, as Van Til was known to do, to, to level criticism against less consistent forms of reformed theology, uh, we would call this um, th- this polemics as as Van Til exercised and practiced um, polemics. It was it has to be understood against the backdrop not of a you know ornery personality or something like that. I mean, he was one of the most you know kindly, friendly, gentle uh, men you'll you'll have ever met according to the historical record. Um, but his his approach to polemics. He believes what he believes was a was a necessary pastoral uh, ministry to which he was called in order to protect Christ's little ones. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, is this something that was that was really new? I mean, were you introducing Van Til to these Colombian brothers and sisters? I assume um, for the very first time. 
Yeah. Well, I don't know if it was for the very first time. Uh, they do have some resources translated in Spanish, but very, very little, uh, very few resources. Um, Bonson's, Bonson has a book, um, and the, uh, I, the, I, I didn't catch the title of it because I couldn't read the Spanish. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, and, and then um, uh, Richard Pratt's, Pratt's book, um, Every Thought Captive. And so they have some uh, familiarity with with presuppositionalism, particularly as it comes, um, you know, from Bonson and such. Um, so that's about it. But there there are no works of Van Til's translated and published in Spanish, uh, which is which is yeah, a shame. That is um, a shame. So, yeah, a lot of them aren't familiar with Van Til's thought, particularly. But mm -hmm. here's good news. Uh, one of the things that I tried to do in the conference was connect Van Til's thought to, to the thought of Gerhardus Voss. Um, and Voss has, uh, of course, his, his five-volume Reform Dogmatics, uh, which is available through uh, Logos. And, um, uh, a, but Logos also has a, an, a Spanish version of that available as well. So uh, that, that was encouraging because that was kind of a, a, an area where I was able to encourage people in terms of further reading. If you want to understand the theological backdrop of, of Van Til's thought, go ahead and start working your way through Voss's Reform Dogmatics because yeah. that's going to give you the, the exegetical, biblical, theological, and systematic theological backdrop to Van Til's thought. So explain for us a bit of the church context, and I know Doug is is really involved. Doug Clausen, uh, as Jim mentioned, is Associate General Secretary for the Committee on Foreign Missions for the OPC, but he also serves as a board member of, of Reform Forum. And so um, we're good friends with, with Doug and do a lot of work with him, but one of Doug's main responsibilities, at least a thing he spends a lot of time on, is, is if I'm getting the title correct, is with this Mobile Theological Training Institute or Training Corps. And so um, the goal would be to, to train up officers in the church, in indigenous churches throughout the world. And he goes down to South America quite often and brings people with him to teach courses. So Jim was one of these to teach apologetics in about a month. I'm going down a little bit on short notice to fill a gap uh, for the group to teach on Roman Catholicism, but I'm, I'm sure they're just going to teach me about it <laughs> because uh, the context being so unique in, in uh, Central America and, and South America as well. But um, explain a, a bit about the relationship here between this church and, and the OPC and just the Reformed you know, worldwide communion, as it were. Is this an ICRC group? Uh, what What are some of the details? Do you know them? Yeah. So I I know I know precious little, and I'm not sure that they. Uh, there are. From, this is my understanding. So uh, brothers in foreign missions and brothers down in Colombia who may listen to this. If I if I get my details wrong, I apologize, and and please send us correspondence so we can correct the details. But um, my understanding is that there are two confessional conservative um, groups, uh, Presbyterian groups there in Colombia. Um, there's one that kind of identifies with the OPC, and then there's one that, that uh, kind of identifies with the PCA, and, and both groups have been helped by um, PCA, OPC, respectively, um, you know, back here at home. Um, but uh, the the groups are relatively small, and I don't know if they're if they're a part of the ICRC. Um, I I don't know what their uh, for their technical uh, fraternal status is. Although certainly we have a very good working relationship, yeah. I understand with with both groups, and um, uh, so it's it is a cooperative effort. Recognizing that in Colombia, uh, in terms of of the religious representation that's there. It is overwhelmingly Roman Catholic, um, and then beyond and Roman Catholicism, yeah, charismatic and Pentecostal comes next, uh, and then the Reformed the Catholicism's state, charismatic, yeah, and there's yeah, that's right, and yeah. there's charismatic and Pentecostal uh, movements within Catholicism there, but that's that's here too in America that's present as well. But um, anyhow, the uh, the Reformed faith is is very. Um, uh, very rare there. Uh, you do also have Reformed Baptist groups as well, uh, but that's that's about it. Uh, and the rest is going to be broadly uh, evangelical, non-denominational and such. So the Reformed faith is a very small thing. But here's the good news. The way that I perceive it, I, I, I think that uh, the Reformed faith is is positioned in Colombia to, to continue to grow. 
I mean, I'm, I'm no prophet, um, never mind the son of a prophet, but <laughs> it, it seems to me that uh, the church is in a really good position to grow. They, they have some really good men and good brothers on the ground there, uh, you know, Pastor uh, Espinoza being, uh, being one of them particularly, who in addition to pastoring this church, um, is, is very energetic. Um, he also has, um, sort of a, sort of a fledgling, um, institute that I think is called uh, the biblical Academy or something like that, or an Academy of the Bible. Um, and, uh, it has, it has a full orbed curriculum, uh, that, that mirrors very similarly to, um, what you find in a seminary curriculum. And what he does is he uh, he takes the classes that uh, that Doug um, helps to formulate for the pastors conference, and then Pastor Espinoza uh, builds on top of the that material and then turns it into a course that he plugs into the oh, curriculum for the uh, the Biblical Academy. That's cool. Yeah, very very cool. Um, so he is uh, he's multi gifted it. Um, he's also taking courses uh, here back in the states. What I understand is pursuing a THM back here. So he's continuing his education um, and uh, and and things you know, just in terms of setting the more broad context. Uh, there there was a time, as many people know, who have been paying attention to popular um, you know media or whatnot. Um, uh, there was a time where Colombia, uh, as a as a nation, uh, w- was going through some really difficult times uh, culturally, <laughs> to, to and, say the you know, least. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really it's been really tumultuous. Mm-hmm. Um, now, now that now you know that has that has improved. From my, this is my understanding. What I'm hearing secondhand is that that has improved uh, dramatically. Politically, things are coming to a more peaceful position, uh, which is helping the economy. And as you drive around. Uh, Bogota, you know, you have some areas that are, you know, that that seem to be less prosperous economically, and then other areas that are uh, seem to be prospering economically. And um, so uh, th- there is the the millennial generation, so to speak, um, seems to be a generation that that is coming up through Colombia, which is which is uh, very educated. Um, they're they're finding and and pursuing good jobs there in Colombia. Uh, the economy in in certain sectors is is getting stronger, it seems, and so um, education, economy, prosperity, and all of that is um, is on the uh, on the upswing. Uh, but it, again, you know, so much of this depends on politics, and you know how politics can be it's so volatile that it could change overnight, mm-hmm. and so you just don't know. But all of that seems to be good for for the church. Um, in terms of the church being able to um, have men who are who are positioned both economically and educationally uh, to pursue higher education and um, and to begin to solidify and establish the reformed faith there yeah. um, in Colombia. So it's so helpful to to hear about that and to be reminded of of these things and to make friendships. I'm glad for your opportunity to go and to make friendships with people in a different country and then realize that we still share a common faith and more than that, even in many ways, a common confession of that, of that Catholic faith, a small C Catholic. So I'm, I'm looking forward to experiencing that myself, but it's also encouraging to me to be reminded of how, how we view all of our different organizations and the different hats that we wear, you and I and Glenn as, as ministers in the OPC, all pastors of local congregations, and then Doug as a, as a missionary who oversees the work of many missionaries, and then all of us as board members of a parachurch organization, Reform Forum, and then involved in various things with the Presbyterian, the denomination to, to think, you know, how all these, what's the economy of all this? And, and what, are, what are the roles and responsibilities of all of these different groups? And I'm very thankful for for the leadership and the guidance of the of you brothers at Reformed Forum to help us to think how best we are situated to serve the church. And we're not a quasi church organization. There are a lot of parachurches out there that that function kind of in the place of the church or step on the toes of the the church's rightful responsibility and authority. We merely seek to support the church, but how do we do that? Well, it's really a beautiful thing when we think about worldwide outreach. At least in our denomination, we consider all of our uh, activities as a denomination to be under the the large umbrella of what we call worldwide outreach. And then there are three main committees that function in different ways. There's the Foreign Missions Committee, which seeks to establish um, 
uh, uh, churches, indigenous churches in other countries that we that would be self-sustaining, self-propagating, and that in turn would have ecumenical fellowship with us and be able to send out their own missionaries to other countries. That's the goal. A very clear definition of what we are doing in foreign missions. And then home missions is uh, the activities uh, where we're seeking to plant churches uh, where we already have established presbyteries. So you can kind of view foreign missions as a planting a church. Um, and by that, we mean really a denomination where we don't have a presbytery. And then home missions is planting churches and establishing churches where we do have presbyteries. And then Christian ed is establishing and supporting churches where we already have local congregations, right? <laughs> so like building up the, lo- the existing local congregations. So all three of those committees are effectively doing the exact same thing according to the Great Commission, which is to to make disciples of men and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to do everything that he's commanded us to do. And so you see, well, how do we carry out the Great Commission? Well, you do the same activity. You make disciples, you baptize and teach. And that looks a little bit different depending on if you have a local church or if you don't, or if you don't even have a regional church. But effectively, you're all doing the same thing. And then Reform Forum merely steps in not to replace any of that. And we don't do the Great Commission ourselves. That's the church's role. But we step in and try to help where we can be helpful by sending teachers to go teach in Columbia, providing resources, publishing books, articles. Uh, having conversations on theology, having courses and stuff like that, and making them available for for ministers of the gospel and pe- and people working in churches to to be able to carry out their God given responsibilities within the context of His body, the church. And to to me, it just seems like a like a encouraging way to think about it, an encouraging way to go forward with this work, rather than stepping on toes and say, "Well, we want to have our own institute here, so we want the church to back off." And we want, we want to you know expand our brand into another country or something like that. It, it, it doesn't have to be a competition, and it shouldn't be a competition when we're all aligned correctly and thinking in, in biblical categories. Yeah, that's right. We're, we're, we're you know at Reform Forum, we're seeking to to aid the church precisely in its mission to um, uh, to the great it, it's com- the Great Commission to fulfill the Great Commission, um, and uh, that's you know it's going to look different in other ways, but uh, we at Reform Forum dare not uh, try to do the work of the church. Um, we're not Absolutely. the church, and uh, we're very, very clear, very self-conscious about that. It's the church that carries out the com- the great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we're here to offer resources that we believe will be of, of use and of help yeah. to the church. Amen. So, and there's a lot going on there. We're very thankful for, for what you've done. Jim, I'd like to talk to you more about uh, some ways that we can capture or or develop much of your, your Van Til material. Hopefully, I don't want to put anything on your shoulders, but maybe down the road we can we could have another curriculum or something, uh, another class course in our curriculum where, where you could teach the stuff and, and our listeners and viewers would be able to follow along as well. Yeah, I, I, I would love I would love to do that. I think, you know, uh, as there are a couple of things that I tried to bring out um, in the course of the lectures that that I, I, I'm not sure are always uh, very well uh, set forth by by um, people who are articulating Van Til's perspective. And, and I already covered the one, which is the pastoral cover, uh, you know, the pastoral aspect. I think that that really is sort of a macro um, motif, as it were, uh, that really everything that Van Til did and said needs to be understood <clears throat> in that context of being being a pastor, even though he wasn't a pastor like we think of a pastor. Uh, yeah, just for know, a year. Established in mm-hmm. a pulpit somewhere, you know. Um, he was, but he just thought, for a year. What's that? He was, but but only yeah, for yeah, a year. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. He was for a time, but uh, generally that's not the way we think of him. We no. think of him as a professor in the classroom and a writer of books and all that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but uh, we we rarely think of him in terms of um, of his role as a minister, and that's really what he saw himself as. He saw himself as a as a minister um, who was going to serve Christ mm-hmm. and his sheep. But the the second thing was is the um, absolute essential nature of the Trinity. Uh, for his approach to apologetics, again, oh, that's it's so essential. 
Yeah, that's something that doesn't always come out in all the the material that's out there. Of course, uh, you know, the exception would be um, Dr. Tipton's uh, dissertation that he wrote on Van Til, which is, you know, just magisterial. Mm -hmm. Um, But, uh, you know, setting forth Van Til's doctrine of the Trinity, which is really the work that set me on um, uh, on this uh, understanding of the role of the Trinity in Van Til's theology, um, which ended up affecting his approach to apologetics. And, and then that takes me to the third uh, thing that that isn't said nearly enough, which is that in order to understand uh, Van Til and his method to apologetics, you have to understand what he was doing, which is trying to bring um, the, his theology, reformed theology, in line with apologetics so that we don't have, let's say, a reformed theology and then an Arminian approach to apologetics, Precisely. which is which is the way that he, you know, tagged, for instance, mm-hmm. Butler and others. Gerstner, uh, you know, and, yeah. And, and, yeah. Yeah, the whole night, the, the evidentialist classical approach, mm-hmm. which, you know, uh, even by reform people, like in old Princeton, you've got an, um, an RB, uh, not RB Kuyper, Abraham Kuyper, where you've got these solid reform guys. But then when it goes to the question of how we engage the unbeliever, um, it, it kind of falls apart and, and you fall into a method that's more keeping it with Arminianism than reform theology. So um, Van Til wanted to uh, make sure that um, uh, that our theology, our reform theology, and our approach to apologetic did sweetly comply. Um, yeah. So those were the three things I tried to hammer home throughout the course of the week. Oh, I appreciate that. I've always thought that the Trinity is so central to Van Til's writing, and you find it front and center in Introduction to Systematic Theology, um, which is a course syllabus that eventually got developed and, and published as a book. Um, but there you find and see how foundational this is. And that's something you find like uh, folks like John Frame will talk about Van Til's Doctrine of the Trinity, um, but not develop it certainly to the extent or apply it uh, as much as Van, Van Til did, and certainly not as much as what you find in works like like Lane Tipton's. Um, but then you also find Frame, who's really weak on the transcendental argument and its uniqueness. You find Bonson, for example, is really strong on the transcendental, the unique nature of the transcendental argument and method, but almost you know doesn't speak at all about the Trinity or how that applies to Van Til's apologetic. And so you have to have both, you know, and and. The, the Trinity needs to be addressed, and we have to understand what Van Til meant by um, how the persons relate, his doctrine of perichoresis, his understanding of equal ultimacy. All of these things are so critical, and um, I, I echo your your thoughts that, uh, that Lane's dissertation really set me off on my own research as well, and so that features and factors in a, in a large measure in my dissertation on Rahner. And uh, what what should be out as the the Ronner Great Thinkers book, hopefully at the end by the by the fall of this year, that's a big feature in there. Same thing with the chapter that I wrote in the uh, Vern Poitras Feshrift. Uh, Van Til is is just he's he's utterly important. He's he's really advancing things in a helpful orthodox way when we understand what he's actually doing. Just a, a quick funny story, um, <clears throat> and and I'll I'll wrap things up with this, but. Uh, you, you mentioned the idea of equal ultimacy, and of course, Van Til talks about equal ultimacy in terms of the Trinity, the the persons and the uh, oneness, the threeness and the oneness of God, the one and the many, um, equally ultimate. Um, and I didn't know it at the time, but apparently there's no English or Spanish uh, translation of that expression. <laughs> and uh, it, it was, I'm sure there it are was, a few. Uh, concrete ver- universal, you could probably come up with one, but I'm sure there are a handful of uh, Van Til-isms that are not uh, that available in Espanol. Spanish. I, I absolutely <laughs> stubbed the translators with that one. And I, I didn't mean to. I just, you know, it was that expression I used. And and I we're, you know, doing our rhythm. You know, I would say something, the interpreter would translate. And then I said, equal ultimacy. And then it was like, dead silence <laughs> you know, there was just no, there was no kind of it was, there was no expression that they have at, readily at hand to to articulate that and so we had to figure out an end around yeah. um, around that expression but if you anyway, want to see your computer funny. smoke i i recommend you pasting uh, a chapter of van til into google translate <laughs> and see what happens <laughs> Or at least uh, the the Google Cloud will will start start to uh, screech to a halt as uh, millions of uh, whatever teraflops start to try to try to understand what he was getting after. <laughs> That's crazy. 
Well, I appreciate that, uh, Jim. I look forward to talking more about this and, and seeing how we can develop some of these themes and, and this course into something that's uh, accessible and usable for a wide English-speaking audience. And ho- hopefully also, maybe we can get over the long term, we definitely want to turn our attention to developing more resources in other languages, particularly uh, uh, in Spanish. Because we know there's a huge need uh, for good reformed literature in books in Spanish, um, Chinese, you know, there's some other languages we'd like to get to at some point. We got a few minutes left uh, just in our, our loose conversation here. So I'd like to follow up and, and just get a little, uh, give you both an opportunity to talk a little bit about what you've been reading lately. And I'll start, I'll kick stuff off because I uh, it's on point. Um, but in preparation for going down to Columbia, I'm trying to develop a couple more lectures for the Reformed or the Reformed Theology and Roman Catholicism class, and I uh, want to expand on the theology of liberation. And so I've been reading a book uh, by Gustavo Gutierrez, uh, the the foundational book, a theology of liberation. Here, um, it, it was written in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the 11th printing that I have is 1984. It was originally published in, uh, in Lima in 1971. And uh, Gutierrez is often seen as kind of like the founder of liberation theology. Uh, what happened is Vatican II occurred in uh, 1962 to 1965, I believe. And then after Vatican II, with all the new documents, declarations, constitutions, the Catholic Church charged all the local churches or local regions to uh, take and apply Vatican II theology to their particular context. So Karl Rahner wrote a book about maybe some of the German um, the German entailments of this. He wrote a book called The Shape of the Church to Come, which is a fascinating book, and it really discloses his kind of idea of church authority and and kind of a modernist revelation. Uh, but for the Central Latin America context, uh, there was a conference held in Medellin, which is a city in Colombia, very well known because a, cart- the, uh, a cartel started there, the Medellin cartel. Um, Pablo Escobar's cartel was in Medellin. So that's how I always remember after watching Narcos. But uh, you see uh, that um, this conference was held, and then they sought to apply Vatican II theology for their context. And in large measure, they were trying to deal with the issue of the complete disparity between the prosperous and those in power and the average person uh, in the pews and the average person in the in the country. And so they rejected, uh, eventually, Gutierrez developed a theology that began to reject the status quo and this idea of development by, you know, economic development and whatnot, because it was perpetually keeping the poor and underprivileged in, you know, a condition of oppression and whatnot. And so he kind of wedded Vatican II theology uh, to a Marxist philosophy and developed what's called liberation theology. And that has since been used in, in a variety of different contexts, um, you know, whether that be in certain uh, subgenres of African-American theology and whatnot have developed uh, a theology of liberation as liberation from racial injustice and whatnot. And so there's some helpful things to read in terms of Gutierrez to help to understand how, understand the Bible and the, and the, nat- the relationship between um, God's justice and what they see as political and social injustice. So one thing that he develops uh, in the book I thought was really fascinating, especially for someone who's read a lot of Karl Rahner, is the idea of love of God and love of neighbor and how those two are connected. So for Rahner, love of God and love of neighbor are effectively the same thing. So to love God, you must love your neighbor. He thinks of the two great commandments. Uh, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But he doesn't want to think of those as two disconnected things or things done in two different arenas. Um, Because loving neighbor is a form of loving God because he's commanded us to do that. There's a whole host of reasons that Rahner understands this. There are a lot of existentialist reasons and kind of Heideggerian ontology behind his reason for understanding this. But at least on a formal level, we could say that love of God and love of neighbor are not discrete, separate, you know, disjuncted activities. Um, So we can agree at a formal level that that's all right. But what's interesting is that Gutierrez takes this 
and says, not only is love of neighbor, love of God and love of God, love of neighbor, that is to love God, we must love our neighbor. But he seems to suggest and and demonstrate that love of neighbor and therefore also love of God must be mediated through particular socio-cultural and socio-political institutions. And so to love your neighbor is not necessarily a matter of um, personal private conscience, that you lo- must love your neighbor in, in a way that accords with, with God's prompting in your life and according to your conscience, but <laughs> you have to love your neighbor in a particularly Marxist way. You know, <laughs> To love your neighbor means very specific things in terms of political decisions as well. And so that, to me, seemed to be the very nugget of the whole book and the whole movement, is this mediation of love of neighbor through particular ideas of and particular understandings of socio-political and socio-cultural forms and institutions. So I'll leave it at that and, and say it's definitely a, a, a classic of 20th century Christian theology. I won't say that it's a, a book that I could stand with and agree with at at many points, but definitely a book well worth reading and um, worth wrestling with, and a book that'll that'll raise a lot of questions. And um, I find the the value of a book is if I find myself challenged and and constantly wanting to have a to talk back to the book. You know what I mean? You guys ever read a book and you're 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 saying, yeah, but what about this? What about and writing in the margins? To me, that's a book I want to read. It, it, you know, not just a book that's telling me everything I already know or everything I already agree with, but a book that's going to challenge me. And uh, Gustavo Gutierrez's uh, Theology of Liberation is definitely one of those. I've been reading a couple others, but I'll leave, it, I'll leave it at that for now. Have you guys been reading anything that's been challenging you? Well, Camden, uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, that would be a good, I think, segue to uh, mention a book that I had the opportunity of reading uh, pretty recently, and that's Alan Strange's book on the doctrine of the spirituality of the church mm-hmm. and the ecclesiology of Charles Hodge, um, which is a fascinating book. And he and Strange focuses specifically on how uh, the Presbyterian Church in the 19th century, in the years leading up to, during, and immediately after the Civil War, were um, struggling with that doctrine and how it relates to the church and the church's relationship specifically to the cha- the state and uh, the union in particular and whether or not the church should support the union. And um, it's a helpful book, uh, not only historically for understanding uh, the history of the doctrine of the spirituality of the church and the Presbyterian church in the USA in particular, uh, but just for understanding the bigger picture picture of what is the mission of the church, uh, what has Christ called the church to do, and how does the church relate to culture, society, to the state, and so on. It's a very helpful book. That's fascinating. You know, I loved reading that book myself, and I did find it to be a challenging book, but you, you, it's the kind of book you could read many times over and think about all the implications and, and things therein. Uh, one thing um, I remember from reading that book was his treatment of the history regarding the Gardner Spring Resolution, mm-hmm. which had to do with, I believe, us slave ownership and whatnot, and whether the the Presbyterian Church was going to make a stand or, or discuss whether that was permissible, especially in the South. Um, and so that was called to mind recently because I just finished reading uh, Jamar Tisby's book, uh, The Color of Compromise which is another book that um, I enjoyed reading, uh, but another book that challenged me and a book that I was constantly having a conversation with and writing in the margins as I, as I read that and wrestled with many of the ideas and suggestions. So that's another book, a, a brand new book. Uh, that one's published by Zondervan, just came out a, you know, a couple of weeks ago. But Alan Strange, uh, that, you can find uh, our interview with him in the archives, and that's well worth listening to. Yeah, two, two interviews, actually. On CTC. That's right. One before the book was published and That's one right. after the book was published. Yeah, one was more largely focusing on a uh, Mid-America Journal article, I think, but it was on the same subject, the mm-hmm. stuff that's, that's in correct. the book, yeah. yeah, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'm, I am reviewing the book for New Horizons, and uh, that should come out very soon, and it's a review article. And I'm also writing a review article for Ordained Servant, too, and I'm focusing there specifically on the eschatology of Charles Hodge and how that affected his doctrine of the spirituality of the church. 
Mm, that's good. What about you, Jim? You've been steeped in Bart and Van Til forever. Do you read anything else anymore? <laughs> I try not to. Um, but uh, yeah, a couple of couple of things. I just finished uh, last month, uh, The God of Hope, uh, which oh. is a collection of Van Til's Yeah, I don't sermon. even have that. I feel and, uh, so woefully inadequate. Because it's out of print. Uh, but if you can find it somewhere on Amazon or whatnot. What's growing uh, out of the side of that book? The, the, oh, the, those are my tabs to, you know, go I was back. wondering. It looked like a pop-up book. <laughs> Ooh, a dinosaur. <laughs> Remind me of our friend Matt Patton, who refuses to write in his books, but uh, he uses those sticky notes and tabs. It, uh-huh, looks, it yeah. looks like your well, book write, is like... I write in my book and I tab them. looks just like so it's I grown colored like, fur. I know. It, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, this is... Uh, just picked this up recently, too. Oh, uh, wow. Some of the articles in here I've been I've been reading. There you go, Glenn. For the listeners, uh, The Essential Writings of Meredith Klein. Hardcover. Yes, the, mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I forgot that we got listeners. I got to say what the book is. Um, and then also, uh, this is... I'm just about done with this, but... Another hard to find volume, uh, The Analogy of Being, edited by Thomas uh, Joseph White, uh, who is a, a priest. It's a, a collection of essays on uh, on Bart's expression that the analogia entis is uh, the invention of the Antichrist. And so, uh, stimulating. <laughs> what back tell us forth. what you really think. Oh, yeah, man. right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he, he, uh, Bart was known for, you know, well, the interesting thing is later on, you know, he says that at the beginning of CD11, and then later on, he says something to the effect of the people who despise scholasticism are of the Antichrist, you know, yeah. so, you know, he, he, he wants his uh, scholastic cake and also to eat it as well. So, oh, man. Well, I got another one, Glenn. I think you have this book, or at least maybe we've discussed it, but it's, um, Conform to the Image of His Son, Reconsidering Paul's Theology of Glory in Romans. Uh, it's written by Haley Gorenson Jacob. She's a professor of theology um, out at uh, out in Spokane, Washington. I, it's, I, I, I'm, I apologize. I'm forgetting the name of the institution. But it's affiliated with the Mainline Presbyterian Church. This book's published by IVP, and it has a foreword by N.T. Wright. So it's, it's focusing largely on Romans 8:29 which is a really important uh, verse and um but you know not only that but largely the hope of glory in Romans 5 through 8 but it really diving down into Romans 8:28 through 30 and particularly that that 29th verse to speak about what does it mean to be conformed to the image of his son so that Christ would be the firstborn of many brothers that that's one of my favorite verses to think about, and, and especially in light of, of Paul's theology of glorification. What does it mean then to be glorified? And she's advocating a new interpretation that's been suggested by a couple people, but it has never been developed. And just, uh, I'm still very early in the book, but I'm, I'm gaining a good survey of where she's headed with the argument, and she's advocating a functional view. That um, is that the the glorification is not uh, first and foremost sanctification or radiant light or ethical conformity or anything of that sort, but it has to do with participating in and sharing in Christ's exalted status as Lord over creation. Let me read you a little section. It says, His visible splendor is figurative imagery that connotes his power or character or status. Put another way, the visible splendor of God, as in glory or kavod, doxa, does not connote the presence of God, but the presence of a particular God with particular attributes and who acts in the world in particular ways. She develops that over and over again and does very long extended treatments of uh, the use of the words uh, doxazo and doxa and kavod in the scriptures. And, um, it's a challenging book. It's well worth the read thus far. I'm not even halfway, but um, I will. I don't even think I'm going out on a limb, but saying this is definitely worth worth picking up and reading, especially if you are trying to understand uh, the theology of the Book of Romans, which we all we all mm-hmm. would do well to do. Very interesting. That's a, that's a really interesting thesis, particularly when you think about how the glorification of Christ and His resurrection and exaltation is tied in with His 
humiliation mm -hmm. and exaltation, right. suffering which leads unto glory, and our present suffering in union with him, which also leads to glory. And that reminds me, Camden, uh, of another book I'm reading, and uh, just just finished it actually, uh, which I think is very helpful in terms of eschatology, and that's uh, the promise, the promise of the future by Cornelis Venema. Absolutely, uh, published by Banner of Truth. Nice uh, hardback book. Big fat one, yeah. A big fat one, yeah, and a very very well written, uh, thorough, and uh, very helpful as far as uh, laying out the different views of eschatology and assessing them biblically. And uh, Venema, I think, makes a very good, compelling case for amillennialism. Yes. Well, he's a superb theologian, and um, I'm sure that that book is definitely well worth uh, the time to read it, but uh, well worth the price to have it on your shelf as well. I do not have a copy myself, so I'm going to have to go get one here very, very soon. But that's that's an important recommendation. Any other books uh, to mention right out of the out of the uh, gate or before we close up here? I know there's so much. My my to read list continues to grow faster than my have read list. <laughs> I know, or can read list. Can right? read list. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. There you go. Yeah, just real quick. Uh, th this is the second edition of Christian Theistic Evidences that's come out. Um, this is actually my first time working through this. This is one of the uh, few volumes of Van Til's that I actually had I haven't read yet and until now. Um, and uh, it's just excellent. He goes through, he takes that first chapter and he's dissecting Bishop Butler's uh, yeah. uh, analogy. Right. And it's it's mm. absolutely masterful. Anybody who says that Van Til didn't take his time to sit down and to actually learn um, and to and to absorb and to um, uh, really process uh, the theology of the person they were critiquing needs to pick up this book um, because it'll put that that thesis to right. the lie. Um, the, I mean, he just he just digs into Butler. He lets Butler speak. He doesn't criticize him. Um, as he's going along at every turn, he sets up Butler's um, uh, views using extensive quotation from his work, and um, it it just shows that he was a he was as good of a of a historical theologian as yeah. he was an apologist. He really was. I guess I'll just add for for the listeners one of the things I've I've seen so often with critics of Van Til is this failure to acknowledge or even to understand the difference between what someone says explicitly and what the necessary entailments of their theology are. Mm -hmm. And Van Til so frequently not only addresses what the person says, but then tries to understand it on its own terms and then draw out the necessary theological and mm -hmm. philosophical entailments of such a view. And so people say, well, so-and-so never says that they're irrationalists. Well, of course they don't say that they are, but when, you know, when they're working out the theology, when we stand on the opponent's foundation— for the sake of the argument, and then work with it and demonstrate the absurdity therein and how it crumbles under its own presuppositions, then we're doing a service here by, by demonstrating these things and carrying them out to their necessary conclusions. But so frequently, people that misunderstand Van Til's method or misunderstand what he's doing in polemics is because people can't understand the distinction or refuse to acknowledge the distinction between somebody's express views and the the proper necessary entailments of those express views. So I just encourage people who are reading to read very patiently and to understand um, kind of Van Til's method and how how he works out his polemic in that way. Yes, you know, and, and it's not an uncharitable thing to oh, do. Oh no, it's the good and necessary right. consequences. Maybe right. not always good in terms of the consequences that they arrive at, but this right. is just using your brain and, and to demonstrate on someone's own terms and charitably where such right. a view goes, not in a slippery slope fallacy way, but um, in terms of, of the necessary consequences of someone's yeah, views. It, it is the most charitable thing to do if your aim is to protect Christ's little ones. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That, that's that that's that's precisely correct, and and actually, it's um, uh, it, it's those who would say no, we have to stick to uh to the surface 
right? You know, I mean, that that's what people who criticize Van Til's critique of Bart, for instance, have to say. Well, you know, you have to deal with with Bart on his on his own terms. Yes, we do. Absolutely, we do. Um, but we cannot just stay with the language that Bart uses. That's that's just surfacey um, scholarship and surfacey reading. What we need to do is to be able to penetrate into the deep underpinnings of the man's thought and then show how those those underpinnings uh, necessarily entail certain conclusions. And that's what that's what Van Til did, which which actually, I believe, uh, shows him and manifests him to be one of the most uh, deep and penetrating interpreters of Bart that there ever was. Yeah. I mean, really, I mean, really, I mean, you right may on. disagree with Van Til's, you know, conclusions and his critique of Bart. That's fine. But you know what? If you read him carefully, you can't conclude that he did not penetrate into the man's thought carefully and, and deeply. Mm hmm. Well, I'll end with this. I mean, he was one of the first English interpreters of, of Bart, uh, published uh, The New Modernism, I think, in 1946. I've been trying to track down a first edition of one of those. I, have, uh, I and Ryan Noah both have 47 editions, and you guys probably have one too, but I'll tell you, and I'll, I'll gloat before you. I just snagged a uh, first edition Christianity and Bardianism, a, a 1962. At least that's what the, uh, what the entry said on abebooks.com. So nice. I'm I'm hoping when it arrives that it lives up to the billing and it is indeed what they said it is. Um yep. but that'll be a nice one. I don't have a hardcover of Christianity and Bardianism, so I'm looking to having one of those. Trying to add one more to the set. And and by the way, uh, Van Til was one of the one of the first, if not the first, uh, American interpreters of Bart who who was reading Bart in the original German before even the English sure. translations came out. Mm -hmm. So, and if you look at his citations that he has in the new modernism and also in Christianity, modernism, you'll see that there are references to the KD, not the CD. So, yep. I mean, he's, th this guy was, and his, was no, and yeah. his copies are still in the Westminster library in the special collections room. And, and you, you can, can see the marginalia where he he's he's with hand. He's, he's, yep. he's, as you were saying, he was talking back to the book. Yep. And, as he's reading Bart. And um, so uh, there, there's sort of this uh, out there, the simple dismissal of Van Til as if he didn't know what he was doing. But if you actually read Van Til, which most people who critique Van Til's interpretation of Bart haven't done, but if you actually read Van Til, you find out that he did um, uh, work. Yeah, but the question is, did he have all those sticky notes around <laughs> his editions of Bart? <laughs> Did he turn it into a pop-up book? It, 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 it was it was most certainly before the time of the of the post-it. That's for sure. Yeah, the post-it. Yeah, he predates the post-it. Thank goodness. Um, oh man. Well, it's been a fun conversation, guys. Thanks for taking the time to to uh, pop onto the the conference call and uh, talk about these important things. And and Jim, thanks so much for your service to Christ Church. Going down to Columbia. We look forward to all of the. No, the honor that. was mine. It was a privilege. I know, and um, but we're thankful. And, and those for your videos, service. Camden, by the way, are oh still yes, there. yes, they yeah. live streamed. Uh, they live fantastic. streamed the videos on Facebook. We'll do what what I can to collect those, and um, and include those in the episode description so people can can mm -hmm. click on those. And you might even share them with some some folks if you have friends or family who speak uh, in Espanol. Then you can uh, you can share the the uh, those recordings with them, and they can. They can hear about Van Til in their mother tongue, uh, right. and and you, you, very much we can sympathize with the translator. Not only is trying to understand Jim's New Jersey <laughs> accent, but also <laughs> communicate Van Tilian terms through a New a Jersey whammy. accent. Yeah, yeah, we feel it's muy difícil. Uh, ay ay ay, <laughs> this is not 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 an easy task, but um, we're thankful for that. So muchas gracias. Uh, Jimbo, <laughs> uh, thank you, <laughs> CC. Uh, I want to point people back to the website. Um, of course, reformedforum.org is where you're going to find everything. And or we're firing up uh, some video now. We got a Vimeo account again. I'm going to start reusing or using that again. But you can find our videos at uh, vimeo.com/reformedforum. Starting now, moving forward, you can also find. Uh, ever since we've been doing the videos now for since last summer. I'll find copies of them at uh, Facebook on our Facebook page as well as youtube.com slash reformed forum. 
I encourage you to subscribe there and then you can you get those videos automatically popping up in your account when you when you log in. But of course we have audio versions and it's our bread and butter. And uh, so you can subscribe on uh, Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe on, on uh, Google Play and, and whatever Stitcher, uh, whatever podcast directory you use, we should be in there. So thanks so much for listening. We hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.